as you look in your own heart, have you fully trusted in Jesus this morning? Not just that you're saved. Have you fully trusted in Jesus that you're living for him moment by moment, day by day? Well, as we've been looking at the book of Revelation written by John, we're, we're in the seals that nobody could un, undo the scroll except the, the, the lamb. And so the seals are being broken one by one as the scroll is being opened and read. And we're to the seventh seal. And the seventh seal opens a new area of judgment, and that's the trumpets. And then the trumpets will give way to bold judgments. As we look through this, what I see is God's grace. God looks for repentance. And you say, where is God's grace? His terrible things are happening. People are dying. People are suffering. People are suffering greatly. Yes, and that will happen. But it's God's grace. For God could say, enough of this and zap the world and all of us could be annihilated to be no more. He could do that. But he doesn't. He withholds his full fury of his wrath against righteousness or, or against sin because people refuse to repent and turn to righteousness, refuse to turn and follow his ways and worship him. They worship wood, stone, gods that can't speak or talk or, or walk or do anything, false gods. And yet God is the living God. He's the real God. And he wants people to turn to him and repent. And so notice also through this section that many bad things happen. But notice how they get progressively worse and worse and worse. Hopefully to a point where people will turn to God and recognize that he is God. It's not science. It's not my own strength or collective strength of a nation. It's not a superior military it's not politics. It's God that is so powerful and strong. And it's in God that we trust. In chapter, chapter 4, John looked over and saw into heaven and saw some wonderful things. He saw things that he had no words to describe, and so he came up with the best words he could. In chapter 5, there was a scroll that no one was able to open but the Lamb. In chapter 6, the seals were opened. And these aren't God's wrath or judgment, but as Adrian Rogers would say, this was God removing his hand of protection. When God removes his hand of protection, Satan is free to do whatever he wants to do. And Satan sets out to destroy, defile, and kill. That's what Satan's all about. Remember the attributes of God, love, grace, mercy. The hand of God's protection is removed it allows Satan to take peace from the earth, cause famine. One-fourth of the earth would face death by sword, famine, and plague, and wild beast. The sixth seal will be a catastrophic geological disaster, so severe that people recognize this isn't an unusual geologic happening. This is the hand of God. It's more than a natural disaster. The seventh seal will be opened and the seven angels were given seven trumpets prepared to sound the warnings. This will be God's judgment beginning. And there are two, what we think of as trumpets. One is called a shofar. It's made from a horn of an animal. And it's used to announce God's provision, or worship. But then the trumpet would be made of silver or some metal. And it would be to sound judgment. It would be used to called troops to war, to battle. And so it was a judgment when the trumpets were used, and these are trumpets, or judgment. Chapter 8, verse 1 through 6, begins with a, a short prelude. First five or six verses, the seventh seal will be open, and then it contains the trumpet judgments. And at first, the incense is added to the prayers. Incense is always associated with prayers. If you go back to the temple, we need to understand the temple to understand Revelation. And the incense, there was a table of incense. It represented the prayers 
of the saints, of those that were trusted in, in God. And in verse 5, the earth reacted. And so it was a um, not something that I think God was looking forward to. In verse 1, it says there was a silence for a while. Have you ever done something or had a task before you and you were contemplating it, thinking about it, trying to think it through, and took a deep breath and said, okay, let's do this. In my interpretation, this is this saith me. That's kind of what God did. He didn't want to bring judgment. He didn't want to see people suffer and hurt and die without hope. But the time had come. And so there was a silence, and then almost as if God is hesitant, not wanting to harm, destroy. What God wants to do is give life and life everlasting. What he wants to do is give us a peace in our life, a comfort, a calmness in our life, and remove the chaotic feelings and thoughts. And sometimes it's in the middle of chaotic circumstances, but when we have Jesus in our life, there's a calm in our soul. God wants all people to come to salvation and the knowledge of truth. And there is a denomination that teaches that God chooses people to be saved and chooses others to be lost. That's not the way I understand the Bible. The Bible that I have says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is, anybody, everybody, of all times, of all races, of all people, of all times, everywhere, if they'll call upon the name of the Lord with what understanding they have, that salvation will come their way. And so I choose to trust in God. There will come a time that waiting is no longer. And when we read the book of John, the Revelation, the time has come. And this is what will happen. Each of these judgments seems to come from heaven. Things fell from the sky. It was coming on high. If you, if, when we read through, notice, it looks like everything's coming from above, not beneath. Through each judgment, God was in control. When events happened, the extent of that judgment was determined by God. Who would be harmed was determined by God. And how much they were harmed was determined by God. So God is in control of all this. The first trumpet is in verse 7. One-third of the earth's dry surface will be destroyed. The second trumpet is in verse 8. One-third of the salt water, including sea life, will be destroyed. It says, a great mountain of burning, burning with fire. And some have said, well, that's got to be a huge meteorite. we got those floating around in space. Some come close to us, just a few uh, light years away, which <laughs> to me seems like a long way. In uh, astrological terms, um, it's close. But perhaps one of those will fall. But I think maybe not. And it may be a meteor. But it's whatever it is, it's going to be so supernatural. And the results are going to be so supernatural that it will be obvious that it's not just something that happened, a natural thing that happened. Several of the tribulation judgments are similar to the ten plagues in Egypt. And, and we'll see that also. In verse 10, the third trumpet. And when the word star is used symbolically, it's always in reference to an angel. And here it's a fallen angel. And the name of this angel is wormwood or bitterness. It causes a third of the sweet water to turn bitter. Many die because of that, because the water is no good to drink. The fourth trumpet is uh, in verse 12. One third of the earth's light source will be destroyed. And he doesn't say that he'll destroy the sun, moon, and stars. He said the light source, the, they will be darkened. One-third of them be darkened. And so not destroyed, but darkened. The light will be hindered from reaching the earth. We need light. We need the sunshine. We need the moonlight. We need the stars for navigation and to see around. Light will be missed dramatically when it's gone. In verse 13 is a prelude to the woe judgments. And up to this point, the judgments haven't been that bad. And some will say, well, this is caused by this geological event or that astrological circumstance, and excuse may be made for it. We've recently, perhaps still in, the, um, the virus, the scare that was worldwide. 
and, and it was excused away. So you just need some vaccination and you'll be okay. And what it wasn't seen is we need to turn to God. We need to let God heal the land. And so that same thing's going to happen with each of these judgments. We say, oh, that's a terrible thing, and people ought to repent and turn to God. But what will happen is they'll turn to a scientific explanation and say, oh, well, that's just a natural occurrence. And it's caused a lot of damage and a lot of heartache and destruction and loss, but it's just a natural thing. And don't worry about it instead of turning to God. But now it's going to um, bump up a notch or two. It's going to get worse, the woe judgments. And this verse introduces the final, uh, verse 13, introduces the final three trumpet judgments, and they will be especially severe to people on earth. So they're called the woe judgments. It begins with an eagle, and it's probably a seraph chosen to give warning to the earth in verse 7. And the first two woe judgments we'll find are demonic invasions. The third woe judgment contains the bold judgments. So all God does is get the attention of people, so they'll repent. In verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth trumpet, the first woe judgment a star fallen from heaven, a fallen angel. And he talks about from the, the, the abyss. The abyss is a temporary place, a place of confinement for demons. And, and demons are real. Angels are real. They're beings. They're not earthly beings. They're, they're other heavenly type beings. And a third of the demons in the early days... Uh, rebelled against God. Satan wanted to be in the position of God, and he rebelled with a third of those in heaven, and God cast them out of heaven just that quick. Luke 8.31 records where the demonic, the man that was possessed with legion demons, thousands of demons in this man, and the demons, he, he, Jesus commanded the demons to leave, and the demons requested, they begged Jesus, says, don't send us to the abyss. Send us into those pigs. They were considered dirty, unclean, and he, with Hebrews. And so instead of going to the abyss, they feared that. They wanted to be sent into the pigs. The abyss is temporary. Their final place is the lake of fire. But in the meantime, they're in the abyss. Demons will be released at certain times for specific judgments on mankind. And keep in mind that demons are, have a certain nature. And so when God releases them, they're not given an assignment to go do something. It's just their nature. They're released, and that's what they're going to do. And so they're released in, at different times. In verse 2, a third, uh, a third blackout will happen. There'll be a darkness. A great number of demons will be released to carry out the fifth trumpet judgment. And they will not be allowed. They're limited. They will not be allowed to destroy the vegetation and not allowed to torment any with the seal of God. And remember where we learned about those that had the seal of God, the 144,000 had a seal of God. And it may be that all believers that responded to the, the 144,000 evangelists, that all those who responded may also have a seal where they're not, they don't suffer harm from demons also. Uh, we're not clear on that, but we know 144,000 did receive a seal. In verse 5, the demons cannot kill anyone, only torment them for five months. In verse 6, the torments will not be allowed to kill. Those tormented will seek death, but they won't die. They'll seek death desperately and maybe even want to commit suicide, but they cannot. They will have to endure the torment. And you make, we make a note here. Those who refuse to trust in Jesus as your Savior, this will be their eternal state. It'll be worse than this. And Jesus talked about the horrors of hell. Look at Matthew 24, 25 and 26. You know, Jesus talked about how terrible hell will be. It'll be a horrible place. And yet some think their chances there are better. There will never be relief in hell from the agony and the torment. And there will never be an end to it. It will go on and on and on without ceasing. Those who suffer great physical illnesses in this life, it will end when death comes, and we'll be in the presence and joy of the Lord. But those who reject Jesus, it will never end. In verse 7, 
There were locusts, scorpions. This is not literal. Their origin will be the abyss. And so these are probably demons that have animal-like features. And the results will be something like a locust or scorpion. The identity of the fallen angel would be um, destruction. And that's what Satan's about, destruction. There'll be two more woes to come. And so as bad as all that is, there are two more to come. But they don't repent. They don't turn to God. In chapter 9, verse 13, it's the sixth trumpet, the second woe. Another invasion was led by four fallen angels and began with the first invasion led by one fallen angel who um, the first invasion could torment but not kill. That's what we've looked at. In verse 15, the second invasion will kill one-third of the earth's population. In verse 16, there will be 200 million demons involved. And some speculate in an earthly way, that this is, is China attacking the world. China boasts of 200 million troops. Some of those are more trained than others, and they claim many. But the description of these 200 million don't fit the army it's of China. Now. But the scripture says demons. Verse 17, a description of their appearance. The description is not human, it's demonic. And so they're they're demons that are, are released to torment the earth. In Joel chapter 2, verse 11, the reason for the invasion, the reason for the invasion is the judgment of God. And each judgment is a little worse. If you still have your Bible open, look at chapter 9, verse 20. And this is key to it all. People still refuse to repent. Still refuse to repent. Now, it, times are getting tough. And tough times are getting worse. The news is filled with horrible things. And I don't think this is going to affect everybody equally. Some is going to be worse. Some may be untouched. But they refuse to repent. They hear about it. They know about it. But they will not turn to God. What does it take? For you to turn to God and say, God, I'm putting you first in my life. What will it take for you to give up those strongholds of sin and let the Holy Spirit deal with those and give you relief from them? What will it take for you to say, yes, Lord, I will do your will. I know you're calling me to this. I'm going to do what you're calling me to. What will it take? Some, in the last times, no matter how bad life gets, they still will not return, repent and turn to God. They continue to worship God. Demons, they continue to trust in their own strength, in their own ability, in their own intellect. It's the same demons that tormented them for five months. They worship those. They worship the demons that just destroyed one-third of the earth's population and destroyed a third of the earth. But through it all, God reveals himself. Sin leads to destruction. Jesus died... So that through him, all people can be saved. Not select people, but all people. It's not automatic. Salvation is not just because you come to church. Salvation is not just because you come from a Christian home. Salvation is when you turn to Jesus and say, Lord, I want to be a follower of you. I capitulate. I give my life to you. I turn my life over to you. I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. We must repent of our sins, our sin nature. That is, turn the other way. And not nurture that sin nature, nurture those things of sin, but instead nurture the things of God by reading the Bible and knowing what those are and doing what God has asked us to do. To invite Jesus into our life, willfully invite Jesus into our life, and then live for Jesus. God loves repentance. He died for us so that we can have eternal life. And when we do that, we will have his peace. Those who refuse to repent, and refuse to turn to Jesus will suffer the judgments on earth and in judgments for eternity. And the only way to escape the torments of hell is to accept Jesus as your Savior. Nobody's ever been good enough. Nobody's ever been rich enough, influential, or anything else. There's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. We accept Jesus and we live for him.
we turn from our secular lives. We willfully turn from what's secular and turn to follow God. In Genesis 15, when God was giving Abraham the land of Canaan, he said, this land I'm giving to you and your descendants for all times. And Israel will always be uh, the land of God's people, the Israelites. But he was giving Abraham that land and he said, but not yet, for the sin of the Amorites hasn't reached its full measure. God will let sin run its course until it is totally, thoroughly corrupt, and then judgment will come. And so don't say, I'll wait till later to get things right with God. Even if it's a call on your life, if it's a, something God wants you to do, don't say, I'm going to wait till later. Because when we excuse away sin, we always go a step further and we sin some more, and some more, and some more. And pretty soon it will it will, it'll run its course. In Genesis, also, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God told Abraham that he was about to destroy these cities for their wickedness. They had become so corrupt. And Abraham knew that his son, his nephew Lot was there, and his Lot's family, and he didn't want them destroyed. So he said, well, if, there, if you find 50 righteous people, will you still destroy it? God said, no. He said, what about 45? God said, no. What about 40? 30? 20, 10, if you find 10 righteous people, will you still destroy it? And he said, no, I won't destroy it if there are 10 righteous people. Lot and his two daughters came out. There were three righteous people. It had run its course. It was thoroughly corrupt. I hope you see God's grace. God's grace. For he's done everything possible to win people to righteousness and eternal life with him in his heaven. He wants us to enjoy a life with him in his heaven. The joys of that. And, and not the agonies of hell. But sometimes a person will get to the point they say, I will not accept Jesus as my Savior. I refuse to turn to God. I refuse to turn from my sins. And I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to be my own person. And I, I reject it all. And there's nothing more God can do. We need to look at our own hearts and make sure we're not hardened in some area. You can come to church faithfully and be a church leader. You could even be a pastor of a church and have a very hardened heart against God, refusing to repent of sin and turn to God fully. As you look in your own heart, have you fully trusted in Jesus this morning? Not just that you're saved, have you fully trusted in Jesus that you're living for him moment by moment, day by day? In every relationship you encounter, even if it's a one time only in your life encountering somebody at a checkout counter or in passing, every relationship, have you surrendered that to God? Have you surrendered your finances to God? And quit worrying about him so much. Trust God. Have you surrendered your health to God? We've got health problems. We would probably die of health problems. But are you trusted in Jesus all the way through? Have you surrendered your life fully in every area to Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm.